the final um, chair's lecture of the calendar year 2019. And it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. But before I do that, I just want to point out a new arrival here, Dr. Zach Hall. Zach, Zach is here. He's officially starting on the first. But <laughs> I understand he didn't make it to council yesterday because he was waiting for a bed to arrive. <laughs> yes. But he found, found some time today. Yeah. <laughs> Priorities. Okay, welcome aboard. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Ted Allison, um, who's giving this uh, our talk today. And I'll just tell you a little bit about where Ted comes from. I believe Ted originally hails from Port Alberni. Is that That's right. right. That's right. Okay, got that right. Uh, did his first degree, his Bachelor of Honors at UVic, did, his, did a certificate in business administration also at UVic, then went on to do graduate study there as well, did his PhD uh, at the University of Victoria. Spent some time as a postdoc in the University of Michigan, and in 2008 he arrived here as an assistant professor. 2014 he was promoted to an associate professor, and I believe it was nine days ago he was successfully <laughs> promoted to the position of full professor by unanimous approval by FEC, which is what my life was last week. Thank you, that again. Congratulations, Ted. Yep. And, and with that, I'm going to just hand it over to him. So Ted, as many of you know, works on um, both the evolution and development of the, of the visual system, which I think is what you're going to talk about today, yep. and he also works on neurodegenerative diseases. So he wears two hats, and I think we're going to see one of them today. Perfect. You take away, Ted. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate everyone coming today, and I'm giving you what's pretty much a new talk, so I also appreciate you being uh, guinea pigs and see how it goes. Um, I begin with, as always, with acknowledgements. Um, today, most of the data is generated by Phil, who's moved on to a postdoc in Germany. Uh, much of it generated by Michelle, who's returned to finish med school. A lot of it on hagfish by Emily, who's gone to a PhD in Toronto. And um, really picking up the, uh, the mantle from those three excellent students is Gavin, who's now a graduate student in our program and is uh, really doing great work. And um, so it's mostly funded by NSERC with support, support from some other groups. And uh, yeah, the lab's fairly, fairly decent size right now. So I thought I'd use a phylogeny as a way to sort of try and give you an outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about rod and cone photoreceptors and their evolution, trying to use development as signatures of where they may have evolved from. I'm going to begin with a comparison of mouse and zebrafish, and then I'm going to um, review what we've learned about hagfish development and use zebrafish as a bit of a platform to understand the early evolution of, of photoreceptors after thinking about the evolution of that very rudimentary eye that we see in hagfish. And uh, I thought it's maybe worth saying, especially for comparative biologists in the room, evolutionary biologists, I don't want anyone's head to explode that I'm making so large a leap in evolution in this comparison. <laughs> um, so if I accidentally say something like I'm making a conclusion in comparing those, I really mean I have a new hypothesis <laughs> and, and uh, there's much to be tested. So um, I'm quite conscious that I don't know the direction of change of the characters I'm looking at and that they may have changed back and forth a few times and that uh, zebrafish might not represent all fish and a mouse might not be a good representative of mammals. So with those assumptions in mind, let's think about rods and cones, which is our main topic. Through most of my career, I've been quite obsessed with cones and the different cone types. Biology has really dragged me instead to think about rods versus cones. That's what we're talking about today. So vertebrates are said to have a duplex retina. That means they have rods and cones, and that's really a, a great innovation in vertebrates because it means that we have an incredible range of photic sensitivity. So rods are able to detect sort of single photons of light very operational even in, in starlight, um, whereas cones, they start, so rods start to um, adapt and become non-functional in even moderate light, so probably our rods are pretty much adapted and non-functional as we sit in this room. Cones take on a more conical shape, thus their name, so we're sort of zoomed in on this outer segment. And cones are um, in different flavors, of course in humans we have red, green, and blue cones, and those mediate our color vision. But also cones are, we know you're using your cones right now because if you're resolving any detail here, 
That's your cones, they're important for high acuity vision. So daytime, color, high acuity vision, that's our cones. So rods and cones have many things in common. They're more similar to each other than they are to any other cell type. But really one of the distinguishing features that we'll use today is the um, membrane topology. In rods, there's these floating disks of membrane, and in cones, they're continuous with the cell wall. Otherwise, there's lots of similarities. In both instances, this is a, an excess of membrane so that we can jam the cells full with the opsin protein. So there's one of the disks, there's one of the disks here, and each of these magenta ovals is meant to represent an opsin protein now expanded out into this cartoon view. So it's a seven transmembrane protein, and each of these little balls is a, an amino acid. And different um, amino acids surrounding uh, this pocket here tune this chromophore. So in magenta here is a, a chromophore. It's a vitamin A-based molecule, and its shape determines which wavelength of light it's most likely to absorb. So in the cones, we have UV blue, green, red sensitive opsins. They basically just have differences in the amino acids that tune that vitamin A molecule for which photon of light it's most likely to absorb. Otherwise, they're fairly similar. When this absorbs light, it changes shape, changes the proton, the protein shape, starts some post-translational, sorry, some um, uh, phototransduction machinery downstream of that opsin and eventually opening and closing channels to start the neural signals. So with these UV, blue, green, and red cones, what do those look like? Well, just to remind you, we're familiar with humans having red, green, and blue cones, and then there's a line for the rods in the back. Most vertebrates, unlike mammals, have four cone types. So here's an, an example from trout, red, green, blue, and UV cones, and there's a dotted line in the back there for, for rods. So in terms of those opsins and the amino acid changes, many, many phylogenies have been made, and we have the rod opsin. It uh, looks like it's fairly derived in the tree, but we have uh, four cone uh, opsins listed here, so I've already mentioned red, green, blue, and UV. And one thing I just wanted to make as a side point here, I chose this phylogeny because it includes lamprey. And so if we go all the way back to jawless fishes, represented here by lamprey, already um, in the jawless fishes we have all four cone subtypes as well as rods. Uh, so we're more, maybe some of you are more used to thinking about mammals, and so in mammals, um, where there are dichromats, um, and mammals, at the, the base of mammals, lost this opsin class and this opsin class. Um, that's eutherian mammals. Uh, uh, monotremes actually lost this opsin class and retained this one, but mostly today we'll talk about eutherian mammals. Okay, so those cones in this cartoon of a human retina um, are wired together from some interneurons and comparing the output of those cones is what gives us color vision or lets us detect that some photoreceptors are being stimulated while others aren't, so detect the edge of an object. So there's a layer of synapses here and some interneurons. Another layer of synapses to some output neurons and these ganglion cells at the end form the optic nerve and send out to the brain. The rod and cones project into a retinal pigmented epithelium and I'll talk about this as we get to hagfish. It's um, the dark melanin, the brown in our eye, and unusually in hagfish, it's, it's not pigmented, so that's gonna really stand out as a character we talk about. And we can overlay zebrafish or any fish retina on that and get the same basic idea. Input photoreceptors, processing interneurons, and output ganglion cells. So for part one of the talk, um, just gonna very try to review as briefly as possible our, our published paper there was a collaboration with Anand Swaroop at the National Eye Institute. And he stumbled onto some interesting findings in mouse and then we compared them to what we saw in zebrafish. And I guess this is um, what you'll see is that the way we've compared the animals is through um, some fairly elaborate genetics. And that's um, why we've had to limit to just those model species so far. Okay, so. If we look at a little bit of the evolutionary history, the appearance of a single-chambered camera-style eye in the jawless fishes, 
we get up to this interesting stage we'll talk about um, in detail later, the nocturnal bottleneck. Mammals go through a nocturnal phase. Their photoreceptors become quite rudimentary. The rods become dominant. The cones become simple in those eutherian mammals. And what um, Anand's group did is um, began with some transcriptomics. And their overall goal here is to characterize what happens in a developing rod photoreceptor cell. So they've taken mouse retina and they've isolated out just the rods, but they've done it in a way that they can isolate cells that are about to become rods and, and then progress through development. So here in a two-day-old mouse, postnatal day two, they're able to isolate cells that are about to become rods, more mature cells, more mature cells, out to a four-week-old mouse and fairly mature retina. And so this graph is nothing surprising. As rods mature, they express more and more of genes that we would call rod genes, or genes we well known to be associated with rods. And that's sort of a, I guess, a benchmark, a baseline for us to consider. <clears throat> what was surprising was that in those same cells that are developing into rods, a couple of prominent cone genes appeared. Some of the phototransduction machinery downstream of opsins and the UV sensitive opsin was present in those cones, um, or present in those rod progenitors, which was really surprising until they matured. So that was surprising enough, it required a lot of validation, so Anand's group went on to do this, not only through this transcriptomic analysis, but also at the level of looking at epigenetics and the DNA marks and many protein um, methods as well, various markers, manual sorting, fax sorting, etc. So that data seems to hold up, but an, independ an independent validation was quite important. <clears throat> and so that, this is how they approached it, and we'll then mimic this in zebrafish next. So this is genetically encoded lineage tracing, so it's the Cree lock system. And what I want you to appreciate, if you're not familiar with this, is just appreciate that we have um, this Cree enzyme is going to be expressed in cells that are about to become a UV cone. So anytime we have the UV opsin expressed in a normal cell, will also have Cre expressed. So it's a DNA recombinase, it's going to modify the DNA, and that those cells are going to express an alkaline phosphatase, it'll make this purple pigment. So <clears throat> this is one transgenic animal and a second transgenic animal that get bred together. And the take home message is that regardless of what happens with this gene expression, even if this gene turns off, this DNA is now modified permanently in that cell. So regardless of this cell's fate, as long as it's still alive, it's going to be labeled with this purple color. So when this is done with green cones, any cell that was going to become a green cone became a green cone. It's labeled with purple. So that was the expected result. And the surprise came when they labeled cells that were supposed to be UV cones, they generated a lot of rods. So I said it was a surprise, but in fact that's you know entirely consistent with what was seen here. These cells were expressing some UV opsin that permanently modified the DNA, and we saw that some of those cones ended up those cone oh, sorry, yeah, some of those cone progenitors ended up generating rods. And it's a lot of the rods, it looks like about 80% of the rods in those mice have come from cone progenitors. So that is quite a large surprise. Um, we wanted to see if that was something peculiar to mammals, to mice at least, and see if it happened in zebrafish. So this, because it requires two transgenic animals that are stably inherited and well behaved, pretty challenging to do this in many other species still uh, at this point. We did it in zebrafish using a different technology. It's called Kaloop, but it's the same concept. In UV cones, we're going to drive expression of a particular protein. That's going to modify a second transgene. Any cell that was supposed to be a UV cone uh, now expresses the fluorescent protein M. cherry. Even if that original gene expression is lost, regardless of this cell's fate, as long as it's still alive, it should continue to express M. cherry. And zebrafish behaved much more like what would have been expected before the mouse data. Any cell expressing M. cherry at one time had been a UV cone. And indeed, all those cells remained as UV cones. None of them became rods. So we have a clear contrast between the mouse and the zebrafish. In mouse, it looks like 
Some of the rods come from cone progenitors, and in zebrafish that doesn't seem to be true. Okay, so this is the, the graphical abstract to try and summarize that. So zebrafish, we'll call zebrafish sort of well-behaved and expected. You, um, I'd like you to just picture that we have a set of fairly pluripotent progenitor cells that's making many parts of the nervous system. Eventually it becomes restricted to be retina or restricted to make photoreceptors. Then some gene switches happen and a pool of those go on to make cone photoreceptors in blue and another pool of them become rod progenitors and just make rods. So our notion is that in mammals, maybe the rod dominant retina emerged by having a switch that some of these cone progenitors now got switched and subverted so that they're producing rods instead. So have a, a larger dominance of rod photoreceptors and fewer cones. And so the timing of that certainly is up for debate, but the most provocative and thus the the most provocative interpretation and the one we went with was what, that this could explain events at the nocturnal bottleneck. So nocturnal bottleneck is this fascinating phase very early in mammalian evolution. Here's an artist's rendering of an early mammal. Mammals went through a nocturnal phase early in their emergence out of amphibians. And um, so a lot of things in mammalian biology are, are explained by this phase in their evolution. So that, um, as they moved to nighttime nocturnal living, they were in colder environments, so the fur and the homeothermy are thought to result from this nocturnal bottleneck. Increased olfaction, increased sensory systems in terms of whiskers, all part of this nocturnal bottleneck. And what I'll emphasize a bit more in the next section of the talk is this um, grand refocusing of the photoreceptors, a massive increase in rods, and then the cones becoming much simpler in their complement. I've already told you many of the cone types are lost in mammals, but also the cone types actually become more rudimentary. So that was the published paper, and it left us really with a question um, about what would be molecular mechanisms, what could be approximate mechanisms that could account for this switch. And we didn't have to search far because Anon is very famous for working on this protein called NRL. And um, NRL, kind of hard to overstate the prominence of this protein in my field of work in um, ophthalmology or, or neural development. It's called a master regulator because it's by itself sufficient to convert a cell into a rod photoreceptor. And it's absolutely required for making rod photoreceptors. So nothing was known about this in zebrafish, although it's been, studied, um, it's been studied a lot in mice. And part of the reason that it made sense as a, as a potential switch for these uh, photoreceptor progenitor fates is it was, it's known that in transgenic mice, if um, one expresses NRL, you can observe exactly this in a mouse. The, the cells that are left that were, would be making cones get converted to rods. So we know NRL is sufficient to do that kind of switch. But we were unsure if the difference in NRL between zebrafish and mice would really support that type of change. So we had two sort of competing ideas that could both be true. It might be that NRL changed its protein function between zebrafish and mammals, or it might be that NRL hasn't changed its function, um, but has changed when and where it's expressed in the eye. So just try to give you a bit more of a feel for this key protein NRL. As we, again, we're gonna look at, um, this is in mouse, we'd have these two cone types and rods, and we begin with the progenitor cell. It gives rise to all sorts of cell types. It self renews. In this pathway, it's gonna give rise to some uh, progenitors that are gonna be specified and narrowed down in their potency. They're gonna only produce photoreceptors some of them are going to produce just cone photoreceptors. Then we have NRL as this key switch. If NRL is turned on, they're going to make rods. And NRL has been identified as a disease locus in uh, retinitis pigmentosa, a, a night blindness. Um, NRL is used as a tool to isolate um, f developing rod photoreceptors to so use them in stem cell therapy. And um, is really a key switch. If we want to use stem cell therapy to replace uh, photoreceptors in the eye. It's that sort of switch between rods and cones that's the, the major issue that people are working on. So from the biomedical field, NRL 
dominates many conferences. And, and I'm sort of emphasizing that, I guess I should just admit, because we're going to question whether or not we really understand what NRL is doing across evolution. Okay, so I mentioned we had two ideas. Maybe NRL is changing its function. Um, this is NRL. It's a MAF family member. The NRL cluster, we've got some fish here and a frog here and various mammals here. There's a huge burst of change in the primary sequence of NRL, so it's definitely changing a lot um, in its primary sequence, maybe its function. And here's a, an alignment across various animals, starting with mammals down to some fishes, NRL in three exons. The coding exons are very conserved. The uh, regulatory elements less conserved. If anyone is good at these types of alignments, Gavin could really use some help doing this over, but centering it more appropriately on the fish rather than the mammal. So I think this is a bit of an over-representation of how much this has actually changed. But we do have that kind of information available to us. Okay, so let's consider a little bit more this um, pathway of NRL and mice and zebrafish. So I would say this is a vast oversimplification of the pathway, barely, barely even the tip of the spear of what's happening. And we're going to simplify it even further. And it's kind of nice, I think this is part of why this is such a powerful and uh, popular gene to study is because it really fits into an elegant kind of model. We have three photoreceptor types, a rod and two cones. There's only two transcription factor switches required to make those three cell types. If you turn on NRL, you're going to become a rod. If you don't turn on NRL, you're going to become a cone. You're going to become a UV cone um, if you don't do anything else. And if you turn on thyroid hormone receptor, you become that red sensitive cone. Three cone types, two transcription factors, easy peasy. NRL, again, required for making rods and sufficient for making rods. It has a downstream effector, another transcription factor called NR2E3. So just to orient ourselves, probably more used to thinking about humans. So in primates, um, we have trichroma C. We've duplicated that red opsin. And then the opsin, is, the opsin gene copy has changed its sensitivity to make green cones. So just help, help you see where we're, where we're going here. So that's typical of mammals, two cones and the rod. But in a typical vertebrate, we have rods and four cone types. So those two transcription factors clearly can't explain that diversity. Michelle in my lab worked hard on TR beta 2 and showed that it plays a similar role in fish to what has been shown in mammals. She did get scooped on that as she went to medical school. But she also then showed GDF6 as playing a role in blue cones. Those aren't really so germane for today. What I want to talk about is unpublished data asking, is NRL retaining that function that it had in mammals? Or, or is it conserved, is a better way to say it? And then can that kind of serve as an anchor so that we could start to understand these gene regulatory networks better? OK, so digging into some new data. Um, it really looks like NRL is intensely conserved between the zebrafish and the mouse. Um, NRL, when overexpressed in the zebrafish retina, indeed makes rods. So here is UV cones in magenta, a scattering of rods in green. If we express NRL in those UV cones, they all become rods. So NRL is sufficient to make rods. We then um, did that same experiment again. So we've got a scattering of rods, and now we overexpress NRL. We've got a ton of rods. We can do it also with mouse NRL. So mouse NRL and zebrafish NRL seem to be quite conserved in function. And those rods, when we take a cross section of them, they look, these are rods, these used to be UV cones. They've been converted to rods. They look a lot like endogenous rods. They don't look very much like the UV cones that they used to be. So that's in the larval fish. As we move to adults, we see the same sort of concept. I need to explain that this retina is growing throughout the life of the animal, adding new retina at the, at the edge here. So this is a pocket of stem cells that's generating new retina. And these are recently born UV cones in magenta and now up into mature cones. So in, the, in these transgenics where we're putting NRL into those UV cones, UV cones are born and we can observe them but then they're disappearing. And we think they're being converted 
into rods. They could be dying, but we think they're being converted into rods. We've done some more lineage tracing to confirm that. <coughs> in the first um, introduction, I told you that uh, in zebrafish, we don't observe any cones being converted into rods. This in the wild type confirms that with um, an, a, a Cree locks, more traditional mainstream lineage tracing technology. So all the cones, everything that was going to become a cone um, is now labeled in yellow. And all the cones are labeled in yellow and none of the rods are labeled in yellow. If we go now to our transgenic, we're turning UV cones into rods and we can observe that because that lineage trace, these used to be cones. These cells here were sure are rods because of their position, their basal in this lamina and because they're expressing this rod marker in this, in this green color. So take home messages in wild type zebrafish, we've reconfirmed rods have no history of coming from cones, but if we put NRL in ectopic, ectopically, it looks like zebrafish cones have the capacity to turn into rods. So I'll summarize that here. These first two panels I've already told you about. This is me, this is, remember I said, zebrafish sort of seem um, expected and they seem to behave themselves. They have a progenitor cell, they make rod progenitors, rod progenitors make rods, cone progenitors make cones. Mice seem to do something different, rod progenitors make rods, but some of the cone progenitors have been rerouted to also make rods and amplify the abundance of rods. Some of those cone progenitors of course make cones. So in that last data I showed you, um, we're now taking the zebrafish system and ectopically putting on that NRL to model what was happening here. And indeed that progenitor has the capacity to make rods and zebrafish NRL itself has the ability to do that conversion. So basically what I'm saying with this type of data is that animals that gave rise to mammals had the capacity um, to, to undertake that switch in rod fate driven by NRL as we had proposed. So it's consistent with that idea. Um, underlying this, I hope you appreciate it, looks like NRL is extremely conserved between mice and zebrafish. It's in both cases sufficient to induce rod fate. So next we're going to ask, is it necessary in zebrafish? And again, this is not a surprise here. We've got the expected data. Most NRL has a DNA binding domain and a protein-protein interaction domain. Zebrafish NRL looks very similar, a little bit longer. We created a mutant, it's a frame shift mutant using CRISPR. And uh, so we get a little bit of um, unusual protein made, but then loss of all the, all the recognizable domains. And these mutant fish completely lack rods in the larval zebrafish, um, unlike the wild type fish that have lots of rods. And the retinas look quite normal. Um, here in magenta is the UV cones. And so we've quantified this. In the NRL mutants, the rods are absent, looking at dozens of fish. And there's actually an increase in the abundance of UV cones. That's also been observed in mice, and so also a good phenotypic match that NRL is quite conserved. So it looks like um, it's not changes in NRL function that drove that early, uh, that drove that evolution at the nocturnal bottleneck. But there was a surprise in this data. So this is an absence of rods in the larvae and it's a perfect match to what we expected out of zebrafish. But when we went to adults, the adults have ample rods in the NRL mutants. So this is a, a wild type fish. The rods are glowing green with GFP and in the mutant fish, even macroscopically, we could tell already there's lots of rods in that eye. As we section through, the rods look quite normal. We've used a lot of different markers. Here is a saturated yellow for rods. There's lots of rods in those mutant fish. These are not supposed to have rods at all. At the ultrastructural level, those rods look pretty normal. Remember I told you about the discs in rods filled with opsin. And as we zoom in in an area like that, zoom in on the discs, they have the diagnostic of being rods. So the message is that um, Despite lacking NRL, these fish are specifying rods. I'm not going to talk today that, about some details that these fish, that these rods have some changes in the nucleus and further downstream, some changes at the synapse. So the rods might not be perfectly differentiated. 
but they are certainly specified as what's very clearly a rod. An important consideration is whether or not our mutants really lack NRL. Um, we've used a variety of different techniques to prove that those are null mutants. The most compelling data is that we've raised an antibody against that C terminus of the protein. Uh, on a western blot, wild type fish, the NRL shows up at exactly the right size for that protein. It runs as a doublet, which is exactly what is shown in mammals. So that's encouraging. That seems to be a post-translational modification shown in mammals, a particular simulation site around here that's conserved in fish. And so all that looks um, quite good. And um, that signal is missing from the mutants and quantified here. So it really looks like NRL is missing from the retina and yet those fish have rods. So this is another um, beginning of a graphical abstract summarizing that. So there's a few um, points that I'd like to take away from this section of the talk. Um, we know that in mice as well as in patients with mutations in NRL, we know that rods um, are absent in NRL mutants. NRL is absolutely necessary for making rods. So we were um, frankly a little bit disappointed when zebrafish did exactly the same thing because it's a little bit boring. Um, zebrafish do it too, okay, that's fine. Zebrafish larvae look just like mice. When NRL's gone, rods are gone. NRL's necessary for making rods. But later in ontogeny, NRL is not required for making rods. NRL's dispensable. So there's a whole series of exciting things that come out of that. First of all, um, Canon in the literature says NRL is required for making rods. Well, we're, we're making rods without NRL, so that's good. And then um, eventually I noticed a, hopefully a pretty obvious pattern. Um, mice, in a lot of ways, resemble larval fish, and they don't look anything like adult zebrafish in terms of this phenotype. And that's very simple, but this really resonated with me because um, this matches a lot of other observations about photoreceptors. I've mentioned a few times, photoreceptors in mammals are very rudimentary. And I don't think anyone's really asked before why they're rudimentary. In my mind, I always just sort of thought of them as degenerate, and I've studied a lot of degenerating things in the retina. So I think I always thought photoreceptors in mammals were just kind of degenerate. But I think now maybe they're actually pedomorphic so that they're, they're maybe stalled at a, a stage equivalent to a, an early developing, um, uh, early branching vertebrate. So here's some classic photos from Walls 42. He's the one who proposed the nocturnal bottleneck based on, largely on data like this. In most vertebrates, we have two types of cones. There's single cones and double cones. Two flavors of single cones are the UV and blue, and these would be the red and the green that I've talked about. Um, they have a lot of elaborate things going on. Birds, um, uh, really uh, lungfish through to uh, marsupials all have oil droplets in their photoreceptors. Those are missing in the eutherian mammals. These double cones are much more elaborate than these single cones. They're a fusion of two cones. Um, just a wide variety of differences. In day and night, these uh, photoreceptors move, so they're accommodating the light, which is lost in mammals. In humans, in mammals in general, this is a great representation of all mammals, it's just a single cone. All of this elaborate morphological and physiological complexity is lost. So mammals have very rudimentary cone photoreceptors, and they really look a lot like the photoreceptors of an early developing fish in many ways. So an early developing fish, all of the cones are single cones and um, they later develop into um, double cones. So it's another view of that morphology. There's um, in zebrafish, we have these four cone types. I've told you repeatedly about green and red cones, blue cones and UV cones. There's uh, two different morphologies, fused cones here, some nice micrographs of it. Here's the double cone, the red and green. This is a UV cone filled with GFP and a blue cone hanging out in the background. So the morphologies are, are very obvious. And 
in a larval retina, they're all going to look morphologically indistinguishable. They're going to look a lot like a mouse photoreceptor. So in mice, all the photoreceptors, in mammals, all the photoreceptors are indistinguishable from each other morphologically, and they um, do not, and they require NRL for making the retina, and so all of that is adding up to a new hypothesis that maybe mammalian photoreceptors are, are stuck in a pedomorphic phase of evolution. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears. We're going to stick with thinking about rudimentary things, but instead of rudimentary photoreceptors, there's going to be rudimentary eyes in the hagfish. So if we go out into chordates before the hagfish, there's really not much of an eye to speak of. There's a few isolated photoreceptors and pigment cells near them. If we go back as far back as lamprey, this is before the evolution of jaws, before the evolution of paired fins, we have what looks almost indistinguishable from a mammalian or fish eye. Um, note it has pigment around the back on each of these eyes, that dark melanin that's absent from the hagfish. Um, and the hagfish also dominant, very predominantly is, has um, no lens there. So it's quite a rudimentary tissue. In fact, a lot of good textbooks say hagfish lack eyes altogether. And that's not true probably. Um, I guess that's sort of the point of this section of the talk. Um, two genera of hagfish, the myzine I associate with Atlantic, and um, then the Pacific hagfish, which we can collect at Banfield. The, in the myzine, the eye is buried under a lot of muscle and, and very degenerate. And so it was almost eyeless. In the Pacific hagfish, there is a little bit of an eye there that I'll show you. And so our questions about this are wondering about whether or not this is really representing a, a, a rudimentary eye that is a step on the way towards making a, uh, a well-evolved camera style eye we're familiar with, or has it degenerated? Was it perhaps something like this in the past and has degenerated? And um, I've come to realize that for the different characters that are missing here, it might actually be different answers. Some of them may have yet to have evolved in the hagfish and others may have degenerated. Okay, so in this hagfish sitting in the bottom of a tank, there's a, a patch of translucent skin. You can see that patch of translucent skin here peeled away from the body wall of the hagfish and a little white bit of eye. So remember it lacks that pigment. It's so striking to a vision scientist to see an eye lacking pigment. And there's a view straight on. There's a, an aperture where the lens would be letting light through to the, to the retina in the back. And a section through that you've seen already. We've got some, something like the vitreous of an eye. We've got photoreceptors at the back. Something like interneurons or ganglion cells and an optic nerve. Lack of a lens, lack of pigment. Okay, so is it degenerating? Well, oh, I forgot to say, we can't get hagfish embryos. So for developmental biologists, this is um, frustrating. We're just getting the smallest ones we can, which are about 10 or 12 centimeters long. Still fairly mature. Um, and the eye is not, seem, doesn't seem to be degenerating. It seems to be changing its shape with size and its absolute or allometric growth. It's getting larger as the hagfish gets larger. So it's not degenerating macroscopically at least. In fact, it looks like it might be growing. Um, this is a cross section through the eye. I appreciate it's difficult to see, but at the margin in each case, the eye continues to grow. I mentioned that briefly for zebrafish. That's not something we see in mammals, but in other vertebrates, the eye continues to grow after birth. And those are um, PAX6 positive cells. There's a zoom in on them here. Those magenta dots overlay here on that margin of the retina. So that's a good marker of stem cells. And I haven't shown that those cells are proliferating yet, but it's fairly convincing for us already that that eye is growing throughout life. Okay, so a lot of people have said the hagfish eye is not an eye, it's a derivative of the pineal, or at least is acting like a pineal. So I'm gonna give you a couple of things that distinguish a pineal from an eye. In an eye, I described we have photoreceptors, interneurons, and output neurons. In a pineal, it's simpler. We don't have two layers of synapses between those three cell layers. We have two cell layers and a single layer of synapses. What do we see in hagfish? 
we see something a lot more like this. It looks like an eye because it has three layers of neurons. Not so convincing that there's three layers of neurons. It's a little bit variable, which would be consistent with a degenerating retina. There is two layers of synapses. There's a synaptic layer here and another one here. I don't think that one's projecting very well. I'm sorry. But um, interestingly, Emily is also able to show the presence of interneurons. So we don't know the identity of these interneurons, which type of interneuron they are, but not all of these cells express the same gene. So there's a variety of different cell types buried in that layer of the retina, which, tell, which tells us it's not like a pineal. It's complex and looks more like a retina. OK, I mentioned that that RPE is really unusual and stands out because it's not pigmented. But we have a few lines of evidence that it really is an RPE and probably a degenerating RPE. So this is called a phagosome. This is when the RPE chews off a bit of a photoreceptor. You can see some recognizable bits of photoreceptor. At the EM level, we can see phagosome. So that's normal RPE function. We've got a little bit of ops and amino reactivity. Here's the photoreceptors. The RPE is here. It's engulfing pieces of photoreceptors, which is normal RPE job. So that by itself is not so compelling but with the last piece of evidence, I think is pretty good. And then Emily's done a nice job. We did RNA-seq and pulled out a lot of different genes. And a lot of genes associated with RPE are present in that, um, in that tissue as the eye overall. And some of them she's been able to localize to exactly the right spot. So um, fairly confident with those different pieces of, ev of evidence that the RPE is not pigmented, and that way it's pineal, but it looks like it's functional, so it's probably an eye. So I don't, so as we go through, um, eyes are bilateral, hagfish, yes. Um, the opsin is where it's supposed to be, yes. The RPE is functional. It's connected to the CNS in the right way, I didn't show you that. It has multiple synaptic, uh, synaptic layers and interneurons, so it really looks like a retina, not like a pineal. What's missing is lost pigment. I don't really have a strong opinion on whether or not it's lost lenses or it is not evolved lenses. There's some information that suggests um, some hagfish have lenses, but it's pretty, pretty sketchy. Okay, so then just last with the hagfish, I want to bring us back to photoreceptors and get us thinking about photoreceptors early in vertebrate evolution. So we've tried panels of antibodies to try and detect if there's a variety of different photoreceptors there. So a variety of photoreceptors would mean that we might have color vision. We can only ever find one type of photoreceptor using immunocytochemistry. And they seem to be rods. And that's a bit of a surprise because everyone thinks cones evolve first. I don't know why they think that. I can find no evidence in the literature. But it's starting to look like maybe rods evolved before cones. This is an EM of a rod outer segment. And if we zoom in down here, that kind of morphology is hallmark of a rod photoreceptor, not a cone. Emily, again, has done some nice in situs on section material. Rod opsin is localized exactly where it should be in that photoreceptor outer layer. And our friend NRL is specifying rods and saying don't be, don't be a cone, be a rod as an independent marker of the homology of that cell type. So NRL is present. Um, is it functional? And so that's an ongoing question. Phil got us started down that path. He showed that um, NRL is functional um, in a, from a variety of species. So this is returning now to our zebrafish platform. We have um, a normal number of rods in that wild type fish. If we overexpress NRL, again, I've shown you before, we've got a massive excess of rods. Can do it also with mouse, a massive ex excess of rods. Well, we can do the same with chicken NRL and lamprey NRL. So at least down to lamprey, we would say that that's a unique set of information that the rods in lamprey are homologs of, of the rods we're seeing in these um, later branching vertebrates. The NRL homolog in Drosophila is called traffic jam. When we overexpress that in the UV cones, it doesn't make extra rods. And so, I was sure Gavin was going to have this data for today, but he doesn't have it. And uh, so early in the new year, I think we'll, we'll know the answer, uh, whether or not hagfish um, rods look like homologs of zebrafish. Okay, so, and then just really a 
brief final part. This is um, research in progress. As we're thinking about this evolution of rods and cones, really at this base, base of the um, evolution of vertebrates, I had an unusual question come to mind, which is if rods and rods evolve first, which cone evolved from the rods? We have this diversity of, ro of cones. Or if cones evolve first and rods evolve from the cones, which cone did they come from? And this question came to mind from this data. This was the impetus for it. I've already shown you this data. And this is the NRL mutant zebrafish. Rods are gone, and there's an increase in the number of UV cones. So to you, that doesn't look too exciting, but it really um, excited me because in the framework of past data, it looks very familiar. There's another gene that we work with a lot called TBX2B, and it gives exactly the opposite phenotype. So in TBX2B mutants, instead of having lots of uh, UV cones and few rods, we get exactly the opposite. This is from Jim Fadua, my friend in Florida. He, in TBX2B mutants, lots of rods and fewer UV cones in those TBX2B mutants compared to wild type. So an exact flip of TBX2B compared to NRL. Seem to be a probably competing phenotypes. We don't know the phenotype of TBX2B mutants in mammals because they die due to, to a heart defect. So, um, morphologically, UV cones and rods have a lot of similarities. I have to say that carefully because cones are more similar to each other than they are to rods, but amongst the cones, um, UV cones look more like rods than anything else. I won't show you that data. You can just take my word for it. But um, I had a little brainstorm, and I went for, we went for a Hail Mary, and it seems to be paying off. I've shown you this type of data before. We can turn UV cones into rods by expressing NRL. And I thought, well, if UV cones really are related to rods in some special way, maybe that won't happen if we express NRL in the other cone types. And I can't believe it, but it seems to be working. We've expressed NRL now in blue cones instead of in UV cones. <coughs> Pardon me. And the rods look completely normal. There's no excess of rods. Remember when we do this with um, NRL in, S in UV cones, we get this huge excess of rods. And we don't get that when we do this in blue cones. And um, so then we ask, well, is the NRL really expressed properly? We have it tagged. It looks like it's expressed beautifully. Every magenta dot is NRL being expressed in a blue cone, but not becoming a rod. Is that some quirk with that transgenic? I said to Phil, maybe we better make a second transgenic and just confirm it. He and Evelyn got extra lucky or went extra crazy. They've made five independent alleles of that transgenic. And in no case do we see blue cones converting into rods. So maybe it is something special with UV cones. Even more preliminarily, we've looked at red and green cones. So this is Gavin te teaming up with the 499 student Hanif. This is a bit more complex. We started with a fish that lacks NRL, so it lacks rods. Now we've added on a transgene. All of the cones are expressing NRL. So we see some rods appearing. That makes sense because we know UV cones can be converted to rods. And then what we're asking over here is, is it just UV cones being converted to rods? Well, maybe because this is red and green cones. Red and green cones are staying even, if we're, even as we're transmuting to rods. So it doesn't look like the red and green cones are being converted. That's preliminary, but it looks like there's something special about UV cones. They have a special um, ability to be converted. So to summarize that, um, we're asking, did rods evolve from UV cones? Did UV cones evolve from rods one way or the other? Um, very hard to talk about, uh, evol you know, make a conclusion about evolution, but at least from these developmental and morphological characters, they seem like they would have a shared history. So amongst the cone types, UV cones share the most characters with rods. That's really true amongst the fish. I'm less of an expert when I think about um, other early branching vertebrates, so I'm still looking through the literature, but it's sort of an odd question that's never been asked in the literature before, so I might give an, us an excuse for some more comparative biology. Various gene disruptions convert rods to UV cones. There's no gene disruptions I know of that convert 
well, there's none, I would know about them, um, that convert rods to another cone type, and very few that even convert between the cone types. And that's not just a, a something weird with zebrafish, it's true in mice and humans as well. So NRL mutants or NR2E3 mutants in mice and zebrafish both convert rods to UV cones. TBX2B in fish converts UV cones to rods. So there's some connection there. And then in that last data I showed you that UV cones seem to have a propensity to be converted to rods whereas the other cone types don't look like they do. So that's maybe, maybe an accidentally stumbled onto a new way to think about cell type specification and evolutionary history of that. So I'm going to stop there with reminding you about who did the work. We have um, great contributions from Gavin, building on the work from Michelle, Phil, and Emily, and help from a team of undergraduates along the way, funding from NSERC, and thanks a lot. What happens if you use that to frame the question about which originated first? Is, does that help you to decide, narrow down, formulate uh, a reasonable uh, study to, to try to address that? Yeah, it's a good question. I've, I've thought about it a fair bit. Um, we don't see a connection between the rod opsin and the SWS1 opsin. So um, really, if you were going to begin with this and predict something, you might predict that rods evolve from green cones or vice versa. Um, but as I think about this more and more, it sort of has an assumption embedded in it that the only way to identify that cell type is based on its expression of this one particular gene. And it's sort of, so we're sort of in a, in a circle there. Um, so it's certainly practical to change a cell type and express a new gene in that cell. Part of why I'm starting to feel happy about using something independent like NRL as a marker of, of cell type. Are, are there any other uh, members of the, the, mm. the signaling cascade that, that differentiate between them that would, might be, give you a cleaner look than the, than the opposites themselves? Because it's, it's the differentiation process rather than the final differentiated product that, that, that you're more interested in. Yeah, and so I guess that that's why I was excited about yeah. this, because um, that is all we know, right? So, so now that we, Michelle and colleagues have shown this, and now we've shown this, we now have, we can now start building. Because this is, we know, we know so much about this. Very tedious and boring, and we can now start being <laughs> tediously uh, comparing, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, given the ancient TDOS genome duplication, it seemed likely that there was an NRL parallel. Yeah. That could explain the, uh, the larval, you know, versus dumb. Yeah. Yeah, good question. So, so you're asking, is there one? Yeah. Um, so, just to fill in other folks, um, Telios went through a, a genome duplication um, after they split off from the lineage that gave rise to mammals. So there's a lot of genes in zebrafish where we have two copies, where there'd be one in mammals, but it's not all of them. It's about 60% are duplicated. And uh, yeah, we've searched hard for NRL paralogs not only in zebrafish, but in the genomes of other fish. And it looks like there's just the one copy. The closest is, a, is another MAF family member. Um, we studied all the MAF family members for unusual expression in our NRL mutants, and there's no sign of anything happening. Just look, is NRL a losing zipper? Does it have a high protein that could form a down? Could be. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, yeah, it certainly there could be something like that. It, you're right; it's a it's a, a leucine zipper. Um, and just for people who aren't transcription factor biologists, that wouldn't take away from the fact that you know it, it's unusual it's that it's absent. Partner protein based on, on mm -hmm. domain, so. Yeah, it's different partner proteins it's using for cell specification than for later cell differentiation. Yeah, yeah, good questions. <laughs>
Very na naive. Wonderful. Question, why are rods shaped like rods and cones shaped like cones? And for these, the zebrafish, does that mean that they're, some of their cones are really shaped like cones and others are shaped like saws in this diagram? They seem to have two sides for the, mm. uh, the bottom ones and one yeah. for the top ones. Yeah, so I was trying to schematize that some of these are, uh, so that in mammals these are all always single cones and sometimes oh, in this oh, is supposed to be a double cone, oh, right. a double-sided saw, yeah. Okay. Um, the original question then, why are rod shaped like rods and why are shaped like rods? Well, there is um, some information in terms of that, you know, those sort of pancakes of membrane that are out here, that that is, um, there's some pretty reasonable speculations that that's creating a physical compartment that's allowing the amplification of the phototransduction signal. So you're really concentrating all those downstream proteins into one place so that they can take a single photon and amplify it into a chemically useful and then electrically useful signal. So it might be something, you know, towards adapting them to be um, uh, more sensitive. Um, but uh, this question, you know, really the question's sort of unanswerable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. You mentioned the nocturnal bottleneck as uh, maybe explaining the rod heavy mammalian eyes. Uh, is there any evidence of what the actual selective forces were that led to vision in the first place? But why do some things see? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> good candidacy question. Um, do you want the whiteboard? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, yeah, there's so much information in, in uh, the photons in the visual environment, right? So if, you have, if we're imagining in the Cambrian, the first animals that are able to start to detect a predator at distance or detect a prey item at dif distance has a massive selective advantage. And so then if you're able to avoid your predator at distance rather than by feeling the water moving around you, this is a mass. I mean, so you can really imagine that selective pressure snowballing quite so quickly. What I'm really asking is, have yeah. any of those hypotheses actually been challenged with data? And, and is there lots of predators and prey that don't have vision and they've lasted for a long time too and lots of other organisms that don't do it? And so I can totally imagine the just so stories that you needed to detect or something like mm -hmm. that, but, but has, have those papers actually been written showing that it is consistent with the data? No, I mean, you know, I think it, it's very difficult to reach back in evolution and, and show that, right? I mean, it's always going to be a set of correlations and embedded with a set of assumptions. So um, you're sort of asking the impossible. Um, you know, a lot of the times, uh, I mean, I have given this talk setting it up a different way, which is where a lot of the times where we're seeing these rudimentary characters, that those are explainable. So like eye loss in a cave fish is quite explainable because that's a secondary effect of improving the olfaction and other metabolism in the fish. It's not due to not enough photons for that to be useful, right? So, um, yeah, uh, you know, it it's all comes down to a lot of correlations. So you start to see the, in the Cambrian, the development of armor um, associated shortly after the development of eyes. So this makes sense with the more predator-prey relationships, but yeah. yeah. Is that? Uh, this is a bit of a leading question, but when yep. you were showing the rods started appearing in adult zebrafish, yeah. were you seeing any of those GFB cells in the central retina? Sorry, were we seeing any? Where, did you see it in the central retina? Yeah, throughout the whole eye. So the, the reason I ask that is because since the retina is growing in its margins predominantly, ah. does that mean, and, and all your transgenic tools are constitutive, but because you can't induce the change in these gene expressions, could it be that you're actually seeing trans differentiation? It's not affecting the development of the photoreceptor. They're turning into cones, but then they're getting immediately turning into rods because of the overexpression. It's not actually an earlier developmental step. They're differentiating and they're trans differentiating. So in those fish where we're seeing rods unexpectedly in the adults, that's um, with the absence of NRL. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I'm entirely following your question. Uh, just, just because um, the transgenic tools, if you're shutting them down constantly or you're mm -hmm. overexpressing factors constantly, yeah. the assumption, the parsimonious assumption is that it's the developmental process you're affecting. Yeah. 
Um, but it can't be differentiated because you can't induce those changes. You can't activate them at a later age. Uh -huh. But what if you could? Would you? Could you? Could I potentially uh -huh. see trans differentiation in mature photoreceptors switching from cones to rods? Okay, great question. Sure. So if we took a mature photoreceptor and put in an NRL, could we switch its fate? I don't have a. I don't. Not confident in guessing yes or no. Um, it might be that it's pushed too far down its differentiation pathway to you know, switch the epigenetic marks and trans-differentiate. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, history in snakes in snakes and geckos of that transmutation, but I think that all could be happening at er an early stage of development. Yeah, the only reason I was asking was because to see that in the center of the retina of an adult, those would be the most mature photoreceptors, presumably. Right. Yeah, okay. Cool, thanks. <laughs> thanks, everybody. We're going to... One quick question. So, quick question. <laughs> um, so there's no pigment in hagfish eye. Okay. Mm -hmm. Were those wild or um, from? I don't know, wild. From a, yeah, they're wild caught. Yeah. Wild. Mm -hmm. So they have vitamin A in the diet. Just right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, Ted. Yeah. Yeah. Pleasure. Next chair is lectures, Thursday, January 9th. Walt Weinbrook will be our, our next call. And Ted, I'd like to present you with your highly coveted um, and well earned. Oh. Thank you very much. Biology of Science Water Bowl. Good job, Ted. I have a question. So, I'm, I'm not an evil, evil person, but. So presumably, the hypothesis is that a lot of the the diversity in cell types in mammal in mammalian eye was lost. Is that the idea? Yes. So it was present and then lost, and has never been regained in any mammalian lineage. No, um, there's a lot of mammals. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, everything I've said, there's, the there's an exception. There's an ex right? Yeah, but they're really exceptions. Okay, so uh, squirrels is the one that comes to mind for a vision scientist. Um, squirrels have uh, a lot of cones and fewer rods. I don't think anyone know. I mean, this NRL is would be the lead candidate. I don't yeah. think anyone knows why or how. But they're really an exception. I mean, that's squirrels amongst all the mammals. Thanks, well done. Oh, thanks. Did that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It's way over my head. Fascinating. Sorry. It's way over my head, but fascinating. It's a tough, it's a tough audience. It's an evolutionary... Evo Devo's hard. Okay, we'll catch up. Are you going away for Christmas? Yeah, mentally, yes. <laughs> I have a question I was too embarrassed to ask. I thought mammals didn't have UV cones. Oh, yeah, I could have covered that better. Um, so, our blue cone is, is the, the homologue of the zebrafish UV cone. And mice. A lot of animals, it's not shifted as far to the blue as it is in humans. Yeah. Next, just, um, so like in mice, they call it an S cone, yeah. but it would be legitimate to call it a UV cone. Oh, okay. I think they call it an S cone because then it doesn't sound as different from human yeah. as calling it a UV cone. So do you know anything in ones where it is more shifted away from the UV, if those can be converted to rods? Yeah, I think that's not, that's it's not, not going to impact because it's just a few amino acid differences in the opsin yeah. that's tuning those photoreceptors. It's really it's at the protein development level. It's a really subtle change. Yeah, but so it's what we call blue in mammals is more like the UV. Is, 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 it, it is the homologue of the UV. And then the blue in the fish is... Oh, is lost in mammals. Oh, Blue and fishes and reptiles uh, and amphibians is lost in mammals. It's, uh, that's only the tip of it. Because yeah. then, I mean, when I submit papers and I say mice have red cones, which is formally correct from a geneticist's point of view, yeah. the reviewers go bananas because they don't have red cones. Yeah. If you measure them, they're green. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's terrible. Yeah. It's very <laughs> if I had gone through it, it wouldn't have made any more sense. It's just too confusing. No, but that already helps because then I was yeah. like, what was, what was converting to right. the, the rods and the mice? Right. But Does some of it make sense? No, no, totally. No. Oh, okay. Well, not, okay. I mean, yeah, yeah, I yeah, yeah. understand it as well as many people, I'm sure, but I, I understood things and I... Wonderful. Thanks. We'll see you Appreciate it. Okay.
Hey. So are mice an anomaly because they've always remained uh, presumably prey items? Yeah, it's certainly a worry. Um, some of the things are reflected in human patients. Okay. So in those instances, like NRL being required, it looks pretty solid. At least but, I, I mean, that this whole uh, nocturnal uh, bottleneck ah. sort of struck me as, uh, yeah, okay, so there was a couple of years of selection, uh, but, um, you know, we've had 60 million years to... Oh, that was a couple million, that was a long period, nocturnal. Yeah.